Um, mm. We will go to we will go to Harris Tweed. Um, we I'm actually plotting a, a trip to Scotland, and we'll do we'll do the uh, the islands and uh, in Scotland. Tamar, hello. It's nice to have you here. <laughs> How are you? Can you hear us? Yes, I can perfectly. Yes. In it's fantastic to have you. So Tamara, um, we've just had uh, uh, a fantastic visit in Italy. I'm going to put the spotlight on you for everyone. And uh, we're, do, do you need to? Yeah, here you go. <laughs> do you want to move so you don't have the sun in your uh, in the eye? Uh, you are you are mute now. I can't hear you. Unexpected sun in England. <laughs> it's true that when we did the uh, when we did the tryout, we didn't uh, we didn't think about uh, the sun. Uh, so, like, yeah, am I? Yeah, it's really a problem, isn't it? Because that's okay. Do you know what? I, I'm sure it will be fine. So, um, wonderful. So, thank you for having us in your studio in Cambridge, and uh, we're going to have a little conversation. We're going to hear your story, but maybe we could try by having a little look around your studio because it has a very specific shape. It's in your garden at the end of your garden. It was built for you as your studio, and it has a very specific shape, doesn't it? Yes, it's, a, it's an octagon, which is uh, four meters across. So it's a, it's a round shape, which is extremely comforting. Um, and it's got um, a little skylight at the top of the octagon, which I will, I'll show you the ceiling. Oh, how nice. <laughs> So, I'm going to take you for a little tour. Um, there is my desk, where I mostly enamel and design. And later on, I will explain about all those objects which are on the table. And there is my little kiln and my big kiln and this is where this is where you bake <laughs> this is yeah so this is where I fire yes and this is of course essential a source of water <laughs> um and So I've got windows in the back as well. And there I'm gonna go closer to my to my jewelry range. Do you work alone in your studio or do you have someone I, working I, with I, you? I, if, if I, I, all my assistants come from London. So I'm but over the years I've had I've had uh, students and graduates and I still have them except it's been very difficult at COVID time because I couldn't have anybody. So, um, yeah, and I, I, I love teaching and I love young people who are interested in, in the field of enamel. So it's a blessing, it's a celebration when they come. And this is, uh, this is my press. And this is some of the work that I'm gonna show you later. Fabulous. Oh, you've got, uh, you've got blooms already. Yes, yes. Oh. The garden is so promising. Oh, we are so envious. <laughs> are you still, still at you in winter? Yeah, we don't have snow anymore, but we certainly, we are a long way from having any buds or any blooms. Yeah, so I know, yeah. <laughs> um, we have a proper summer and we haven't got it. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know. <laughs> so um, 
I am going to, uh, which we thought that we would do a mix of uh, sharing screen and showing images uh, for you to, uh, uh, to tell your story. And um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, of course, what I had prepared is not there. So let me just go back to it. Um, Sorry, lady, um, I just hit a little technical uh, glitch here. Hi, Tamar. Hi. Hi. Why don't you just uh, go ahead and I'll, I'll catch up with you. I'm having a little trouble hearing, so. Oh, this is this is uh, might be my my <laughs> my computer, but I will. It's on. I will try and speak more loudly. Is that better? It's a little better. Uh, sorry, I've got my my volume turned up all the way. Um, yeah, so so is mine, but it might be to do with my computer. So do do, please. I'm say listening. <laughs> I can I can hear Tamar well, so I'm not oh, okay. sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, I I I'm going to start about um, the first picture, which we'll see in a minute, is to do with Jerusalem. So um, I just uh, want you, I want to share with you this sort of the story where I began. Um, so my grandparents left Germany in 1933. So I had a, a very clever, actually it was my step-grandfather, but he was very clever and he saw what's going to happen in Europe. And he decided to take his family to Palestine. Um, and it's incredible that my grandmother agreed because she was rather used to Berlin life um, and it was pretty tough then in Palestine. And then my father left Holland in the last minute before um, the Germans, three months before the Germans invaded and as a doctor. And he met my mother in the hospital. My mother was a nurse. And consequently, I was born on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. And I always think it is a privilege to be um, connected to the city. Um, and I always, I always go back to Jerusalem because it's such a wonderful, complicated, but completely magical city. Um, I, I was surrounded when I, <coughs> when I was young by all the objects that they brought from Germany. Um, and I was, um, uh, the importance of beautiful objects were, uh, you know, I, this is where I learned to take notice of, of beautiful things. Oh, here we are. Okay. So what I don't know, yeah, we just, just we're just going to have to do that because I, uh, if I have to go into the full thing, um, it's going to take us forever. So can everybody see the image in a, at least on most of the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. And um, so I was surrounded by absolutely beautiful things. And I'm, I'm sure it's made, you know, it's it sort of, I, this was a great influence of my, my, the history of my family from Europe. Um, and also, I mean, the beauty of the city, I mean, the archeology, span um, 
the country, the, the beautiful landscape, uh, the mystery, I, this is all influences were still very, very powerful. Um, then we moved to Tel Aviv and my first encounter with a, to, something to do with jewelry was to um, meet a Yemenite jeweler who came recently from the Yemen. Um, and he told me filigree, which is um, also influence um, the very intricate wire work, I'm sure is reflected in my work. Um, and if you go to number three, Oh, three, this one. Yeah. So here is an example of beautiful enamel work, which is um, Byzantine. So it is 10, 11, up to 13 um, AD. And you can see the most beautiful, beautiful colors, and um, which are so uh, vivid and the contrast with the metalwork and the craftsmanship and the, you can see the personality of the, of the saints, you know, it is, um, and the fact that it is so, um, it's one object, the color and the metal is, is, is permanent. And you can see it in the museum and it's like it was made yesterday. So I think, um, the Byzantine enamel had the most, the biggest influence on my work. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about enamel now. Um, I'm going to show you a piece of cloisonné that I made then, which was long, long time ago. Um, Can you bring it? Yes, perfect. So it's totally abstract and probably was reflected the, art, the kind of art, it was more cubist art that I was influenced by, but these are very, very fine gold wires. So all the terminology of enamel um, is in French. So this is a technique of cloisonné. So the Byzantines did cloisonné. Cloisonné means little island in French. Um, so this is one, one technique in anomaly, but there's others which, which I'll, I'll go a little bit later, but I can show you, an un, this is an unenameled napkin ring. So you can see the recess. Can you bring it closer to the, uh, maybe a little bit closer to the camera? That's good, up, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is called champlevé, which means the metal is dug out and then filled with enamel. And um, of course, there are other other ways of enameling, and I I've, I'm really enjoying using all the techniques that I've learned um, and 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 pushing the boundaries um, of what I can do with this magical material. So enamel is basically silica, which is glass, mixed up uh, with other components like potash and lead. I mean, today, a lot of enamelers don't use lead anymore, but I still belong to the old school. The more poisonous the material is, the, the more beautiful it is. That's it. So unfortunately, I'm, I've been always very careful, but and once it's fired, it's not dangerous. It's just dangerous for the people who actually make it. Um, so very few factories still do it, but they do it in England and in France. Um, Tamara, before we go into the, uh, uh, the more detailed uh, aspect of the process, I'd like to dig a little bit into your story here. Um, because <laughs> there is a lot in the yeah okay in the six minutes. Um, so you you met this uh, Yemenite jeweler. I mean, how did you meet him? Where was it? What was the uh, what were the circumstances? Well, it is a story, like everything in my life, but it's or everybody's life, I suppose. Um, he was 
around the corner in Tel Aviv, every time I used to pass by his little shop, I saw all these women working. And, and, and one day, I think somebody told me that they were students. So I knocked on the door and I said, um, can you also teach me filigree? He said, yes, I will. I'll keep two pieces and you take one. Everything has to be made times three. So he made sure that he could sell what I was making. And I learned, and I kept one piece. And um, of course, I never got to three pieces, but <laughs> we became friends. And he, he was a very famous Yemeni jeweler. And you know, they just came recently in the 50s. They came, the whole group, a, a lot of Jews came to, to, to Israel. Um, and then, um, so I'm, I'm one of the generation of women who've actually learned how to, how to use filigree which is still used today. Is um, he still alive? I don't know. I don't know. I think then I thought he was very old, but I was, very, I was 16. <laughs> but so I don't know if he is, is around or not. Um, so this is a story of my filigree. Yeah. So you, you went to his uh, studio on a, on a regular basis to learn while you were, while you were going to, while you were going to high school, I assume. For high school. Yeah. And then I trained as an art teacher for younger children. Um, but my, it was quite clear um, that I wanted to study jewelry and I applied to the UK where I was accepted as um, to the, what is today's St. Martin's College of Art, um, which was, I didn't realize what a big step it was. I was 20 and I was plunged into <laughs> to the place I still live in. And, and it was extraordinary. I had the most extraordinary teachers Students this day don't have all these benefits. I mean, we were spoiled. And I had the teachers sitting. The most important thing about studying a craft is actually to sit next to a master because you, could, you can't learn from books. You have to see somebody else teach you and showing you what, what they're doing. So I'm very, very grateful. So you you arrived in you arrived in London. You're 20 years old. How how good is your English? Well, because of my sort of international family, I had a grandmother in New York. So the only way I could speak to her was English. My father spoke five languages. My mother spoke mostly German with my grandmother. So I I had enough English. I mean, it was it was okay. And did you know anybody? Um, no, I didn't. And that was, I finally found an Israeli girl, we shared a place together. And uh, um, yeah, and then I had an apprenticeship in Hatton Garden. Now Hatton Garden is um, a, a street in London where you can buy diamonds, but a lot of the craftsmen are still there. Of course, the whole area has been developed so people have to move out of London but Hatton Garden is still where you can buy gold and you can buy diamonds and and I believe the place where I had my apprenticeship is still there so I had a very good training um I fell in love with enamel um which I did not study in my in in my course it came later um, and I have started designing um, a range of enamel, enamel jewelry. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can look to... Yeah, I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the presentation. So here we are. Yeah. So this, this was made for um, an Israeli exhibition and it was called a piece of Israeli, an Israeli jewelry. So what is an Israeli jewelry? It was not clear, but what my interpretation of it is um, to, to make a statement about what it is about. And I called it sinking in sand. And it, it was about 
my experience living by the sea in Tel Aviv and my roots still in that place and also experimenting with the medium of enamel. So it's 18 karat gold, copper and silver and silver foil. So the three identical brooches, which is a, telecom, a slightly different story. And this is the lovely thing about enamel. So each metal reacts differently to enamel. So, if so you, yeah. what is the story? What is the story of each each brooch? Well, I mean, they're all about sinking in sand. So they have got um, um, the same pattern. Um, the gold is the most precious one, I suppose, and it's got white enamel in the middle, which is a kind. It is a special enamel, which is. It's called opalescent. It, look, it looks like an opal, and I use that color a lot. We've got transparent colors, and we've got colors which are opaque, which you can't see through them, and we've got opalescent colors. So on the gold is opalescent, which makes it more precious. And the copper one is more earthy, I suppose. It's more about the ground. Um, the silver one, is I diffused the, you know, made it more abstract by using more foil. So it's got, a, it's got a different personality, but they're all the same story, just expressed in different ways. You just, it was an experiment. So then there's a, there's a I, um, before we carry on, I wonder if you could um, just move your, um, your chair slightly because you're directly with the sun behind you we can't quite see you uh, yeah, with, without having the sun in your face maybe i know it's a little of a challenge okay i think we'll be fine now great perfect we can see you now much better thank you okay okay so this is an um i've done that for an exhibition in in London, and there was another very wonderful artist that I shared this invitation from Electrum Gallery, which unfortunately is not there anymore. Um, and it is um, a necklace which is made out of 18 carat leaves. So a lot of my work is weaves through the natural world and it's, it was the beginning of me working with leaves and trees, and you can see it's enameled, and I can actually show you. I'm going to move my table. You'll excuse me. I'm just. We really had not planned for the sun to be out today. <laughs> it's such a beautiful, bright artist studio. <laughs> you know what you want when you're working. Yes, so there, there is an actress. And I love working with gold. <laughs> and it's got it's got it's got a sound. So it's got a, a sort of like a you know like leaves in the wind. Wrestling in the wind, yes. Wrestling in the wind. Yeah. And each leaf it's got enamel in it. Can you bring it close? Yeah, a little bit closer up. up. Your camera is at the top of your screen. There we go. Okay. A little bit higher up. That's it. Perfect. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and I continue. I, I, I work with gold only by commission. But I love working with gold um, because it's, it's it's about the material. I just love metal, but it just it is it's malleable yet it's very strong and it 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 will it lasts and it doesn't oxidize like silver. So I this is why um, and it beautifully enamels, of course. So that's the beginning of your uh, your love for. Um... 
Yes. And and we're going to see that uh, theme start to develop itself and then add new techniques. So here you have that very organic, the round shape, the egg. Yeah. I know that you you particularly um, uh, fond of this 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 work. Yes, and it is you know there's some things I still make even though I've made them over twenty years ago. Um, so and I love making them. It's just like. Um, because I, you know, I've tested it, it, it works. It's very, it's amazingly strong shape, the dough. And the metal and the silver, gold, and, and gold foil, which is very, very fine rolled out um, paper, uh, gold paper, which I mm -hmm. fused into the enamel. And then you move to a different, slightly different look and technique. Yes, well, I just, I, I, I I suppose it's to do with my love of color, my love of painting. I needed to express myself on bigger surfaces. And I started making vessels. And I made um, a, a blessing cup, a kiddush cup for a competition in Israel. I got into a, a which was enameled. I was shortlisted and that catalog was seen by the curator of the Jewish Museum in New York. And um, I got this wonderful commission to make a pair of marriage cups. Ah. You have to ignore this. These are just gorgeous. They are, they look like they've been painted, yes. Oh, just. Yeah, it is, it is so, I mean, this is a, this is a thing about enamel. It is such an amazing um, medium to work with. And I would just, I just wanted to express, um, um, you know, something to do about a partnership, about two together. And, and, and um, I, it took me a long time. It's difficult to see how much gold it is, but all the yellow on the top is actually, so the gold is, is slightly iridescent. So I believe this, they're still in the Jewish Museum in New York. So um, <laughs> I don't know if they're going to be on show, but they're there. Um, so that was an enormous conflict. And then I, consequently, I've started making vessels for, by commission. And I just love the idea of celebrating an object a bit of, you know, when a person cherishes an important object and wants to mark a, um, an occasion or to remember something, I, it's, it, it's, it's an object which gives the person a continuous um, pleasure. And, and I think it's one of the, one of the reasons I, I sort of enjoyed doing it and doing it also for the Jewish community, which is my tradition, even though I'm totally unorthodox, but it's, it is something special that people can celebrate their Sabbath with, a, with one of my cups. Um, and here was another breakthrough with um, a, a commission from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And for the first time, I was asked to use text. So the lettering is, <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Is the benediction on Friday night, and here are the letters, and he said, "Is um, it is um, how to say it? <laughs> I lost my words. Um, it uh, you bless the 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 fruit of the wine. Yeah, and it's it's and the kiddush. It's the Friday night kiddush, and it's the blessing yeah. of of the the wine and the bread, and and welcoming the Sabbath. That's right, and and the fact that it is, you know, it is recited again and again and again, and the pattern reflects this continuity that it goes twenty times around, um, and it, it reflects this this. Um, you know what? What, a, what a, is a kiddush cup about? And the white enamel is opalescent, 
again, it's slightly reminiscent. And the, the, you know, it's a bit like welcoming the bride. The, the bride, you know, Shabbat is like welcoming a bride. A bride. So this is why I used white. And the gold is the is the precious moment when you hold the cup um, on the golden part. And this is the most kind of important is the contact of the hand of the person to the cup. So. <laughs> There's also um, a tradition and um, nowadays when we all um, try not to have any contact with each other, but, and I don't know if it's in all the families, but in, in our families, certainly, and I've seen it, you know, the generations before us, that um, the family that is around the table and is celebrating Shabbos, you all drink from the same Kirushka. So um, the, the father in the traditional uh, families says the blessing and then passes the cup uh, from member of family to the next and each one says the blessing quietly and then takes a sip of the wine so there is again that's that idea of circle of unity of sharing something in a beautiful moment um, that is a celebration um, um, I just wanted to tell you that it, the, the cup was cut, the letters were cut, engraved, um, with, with the help of the computer. Um, of course, I, I submitted the design to one of my colleague craftsmen, and it, it was, you, I'm sure somebody could do it by hand, but it would be very difficult, but it's, it's absolutely perfect all the way around. And I don't think I could have done that by hand. So it was the first time that they used some kind of a digital um, mythology, then I, which, which also meant that I, I pushed a little bit uh, more than the way I was working. So I really enjoyed it. And I do have the test piece here. This is the one thing, the rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. see? Yeah. It's lovely. So a lot of uh, a lot of symbolism in in the cup in the vessel from the moment you did that first set um, for yeah. this young couple, and then you carried on with the uh, the circle and um, uh, always in the Jewish tradition. This is a set of uh, uh, candlesticks well, because. My client was not Jewish in this case, but his father died and left him some money. So he came to me and said, I want to remember my father, you making me a set of candlesticks. So it's a bad memorial, but it is more, you know, it is not necessarily Jewish. And I like it at my work, you know, even if I do, um, Judaica pieces, the, the, the design is more, it is, it is not specifically um, just for Jewish people. So um, I've got a lot of clients who are, who are of course not Jewish and um, it was most important it has to do with the being a memorial piece. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of uh, commission work. How do you work with your client? Do you meet with them? Do you interview them? Do they send you photos? Or um, how do you get into their emotional space to be able to translate it into the object that they're going to relate to? Well, it's not, it's, it's a very interesting dialogue. Um, with some people, it's much easier. I mean, this, this candle holders, I mean, it was, I always say it was the client from heaven because he was just, it's to do with trust. And, you know, some people have a very strong idea what they want. Um, um, if they've seen something I've done before, or sometimes I'm not able to do it for them. So I come to the point and say, this, you know, I'm not the right person for you to make it. But I think... I just like to have my own freedom. I'd like people to trust me that I'm going to do the best. 
but of course they have to you know we have to agree together this is what i'm doing but at one point i they i ask people to let go <laughs> and i need to be left on my own um and so i have some wonderful clients um and it worked and i think it's a very you know it's more than just it's the dial the the pieces become something else when it goes to you do it for another person but there's still the relationship that, that i you know people come to me you know 30 years ago you know i'm still wearing this or i'm still using your your cup every friday this is my reward it really is my you know the, this the special relationship between the client and the maker is it's not an easy one but it's uh, it's rewarding when it works uh, in in the case of these candlesticks, why did you have four? Um, I don't think that there was no. I think we discussed it. He he wanted to he wanted to set. I don't think there is a symbolic reason to it. Um, um, you know they 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 come apart on the top, and he actually uses um, a little tea light on the top. So can you see the little recesses? Mm -hmm little holes on the top so you can see the light through them so they're good for candle for putting a candle but also putting little tea, tea lights in there. Mm, very clever um so that's your uh, studio and we're going to we're going to come back to that um i would like to um uh, move a little bit um more object that uh, you were commissioned and have created um, we can see the evolution. Um, this is an interesting story. You want to share this one? Yeah, this is um, a collaboration with a, 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 an Israeli a silversmith who lives, a, a woman who lives in London by the name of Adito. And um, I'm Studio Fusion Gallery, which I'm, I'm still still a director of, but I'm soon, soon going to retire from it. I've been a director there for 24 years with the, with the cooperative, which is a group of women. Um, anyway, we um, curated an exhibition, exhibition together calling Edge to Edge. So it was it was researching what what is everything about the vessel, you know, wh where's the border, where does it start, where does the edge start and where it ends. And it, it was very abstract. And she's a very, very interesting um, um, maker. And um, we came together. I came, I come, came from an enamel, and she came from the, from more from the making the actual forms. And also, we did it in Hebrew, which was great. We still share the same language. Um, and this is the result. So you can see a dome which is split, um, and um and then there is um you know there, there, there was a, a group of work this is just a, one two of them but um it was experimental and and somebody came to the gallery and it was most unusual because it wasn't exactly you could use it or anything it was just two objects sort of talking to each other and then it and then it was bought so it it was, I, I love working with another artist. It's, uh, that's another thing I, I, I enjoy. So this, the, the uh, collective that you briefly mentioned, um, I'm going to give a little bit more story about it because it's quite an achievement. It is a collective of women, uh, silversmith and jewelers, and uh, it's called uh, a Fusion Gallery. It's at the Oxo Tower now. Um, Susan, it just closed. We had to close. Oh, you had to close. Oh, oh. it's going online, so it's not completely closed. The gallery is not closed. The physical, the physical place is closed. Yeah. Right, um, and uh, uh, you, you are all. How many of you were there? Three, four well, of you. We started. We started six, and then seven. Then it was in the last two years. It was four. Okay. And um, are you all um, 
uh, associated to the goldsmith? Except one, yes, we are. So um, the three of us, three of us always um, um, show at the goldsmith fair and we'll do this year. Okay, so do you want to uh, remind us of their names? The date is, well, it's still got to be confirmed whether it's going to be physically in the Goldsmiths company or it's going to be online like last year, but it's going to be at the end of September, uh, October, mostly into October. And what are the names of your, um, of your partners in the collective? Uh, Daphne Krinos, who is a very, um, and, and uh, Louise O'Neill. Um, both both jewelers. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed uh, Daphne back in uh, June uh, last year. I will share the link to that if you missed it when we did the series with the Goldsmith Fair. Um, and it's a lovely work. So let's go now into um, the story. I mean, I love this one. We'll we'll say a little bit about uh, about this one and about the work. And then we'll move to the photos and your and your family story and the roots. Okay, so this this uh, this is called um, there was an exhibition in in Devon through the British Society of Enamelers, which I was a member for many years. Um, and these are copper, and for the first time I used um, liquid enamel, which is um, it is. You dip the cups or spray them, um, just, which is another way of um, laying enamel. So you fire them. And then um, I started um, using print on enamel. So um, these are the trees, photographs of my trees in my garden, um, which have been made into enamel transfers so uh, it is like normal print except you using a silk screen and you using enamel enamel colors or enamel it's colors. wonderful to be able to create a legacy of where you live and and have something that you can you can share you can pass on i can see a set like that for each children or grandchildren or I mean we can to, to be able to connect um, the story to, to a piece like that and that brings us to uh, the story of your family really yeah. and that's where I would really like to have you tell us everything. So um, my grandfather um, was a soldier in, in the First World War and he um, left a diary, uh, which is it is in Tel Aviv now with my brothers. Um, but he was he was in the medical corps. He was a, a nose and throat um, doctor, and but I think he was, you know, he was a, just a general doctor there because there's so many. Um, And I, I excavated this treasure trove at my parents' house um, and it, I just recorded it by pho photographing it and using that material um, in, um, on my cups. So it was, I, 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 he, it was 1916 and he was stationed in France in St. Paul's. Um, and together with these images, I also used um, photographs of my mother's family and my grandmother in Berlin, and then in Palestine, and also included my own photographs of contemporary Jerusalem. So it was, um, a way of I, I responded to the to the topic of the exhibition, which was a, a contemporary. Uh, it was about a contemporary medal, um, 
and it, and it was in Bristol and it was uh, commissioned by my colleague Elizabeth Starrell. And it was it was a very um, it's the first time that I you know I made directly a memorial piece, um, which I'm I'm just going to show you. Do you this want to is, come a little bit closer? Yeah. This is his medal of the Iron Cross. And he, he won, he, he got this medal. And on top of it, you can see my design for a peace medal. This mm -hmm. is a, see, I impose, superimpose olive branches on the cross. So did you, did you come across the diary at the same time as this project started or did it just happen to no, no, at the I same did. time by mistake? By chance. No, no, no. It was, it was uh, definitely. So I'm just, these are. Can you see my grandfather yeah. on the top? I think he's doing something to somebody's leg. Right. Um, this is in the trenches. Which one is he? Ah, okay. Um, he's the one, is this one. Okay. So on our, on our left, looking at the screen. Yeah. So this, this uh, memorial commission happens and you decide to use your family history and, and the, the cross. Yes, yeah. So I've, I've, I've made a contemporary badge. I'm just going to show you. Can you bring it up a bit? Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay, so that's the badge you made, stylizing the cross on the medal of your grandfather. Yeah, and I believe there's a, one of the images on the PowerPoint. Is there. Yeah, I'm going to go back to that. And that was made like like a I had made a die. So when you when you make coins, you you use a die. So you know I have a a steel die which I can make hundreds and hundreds of them. So I, I you know, I, I keep making them. I think that's the only image we have, isn't it? Um, Tamar? Um, um, oh, here it is. Yeah, that's here it. Here it is, yes. Yeah. yeah, there it is. There's my grandfather. I just want to show you while we're talking about it. So Can these are all your, yes, these are all your drawings? Yeah, they're my drawings. Uh, th these are, these are the, these are the peace bashes. And these is another design of a barbed wire going into an olive tree. And that was your expression of going from war to peace and of recognition yeah. of service yeah 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 and that inspired me to do it yeah mm -hmm. but it's it has been uh, I, I learned quite a lot about the first world war and um and then of course the story of palestine i just want to show you here this is one of the calendars that was in his diary that's incredible Did you, I mean, do you think that you're going to be um, diving again more and more into these family archives to express I, more I of your think, work? Um, um, if I'm asked, I, will, I was asked whether I will do um, a memorial bowl for somebody. And of course I will do it, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I would, yeah. So let's go back to, um, to the photos. And uh, so we see here, 
the image and the cross and the bowl. So again, we have the idea of the vessel of the, that kind of unity and circle at the same time holding it in the hands. Yeah. Um, I've, got who one, are, I've got one left, I'm just gonna show you. Oh, you do? So this is, this is copper. Mm -hmm. um, this is enamel just, just in black. So it's just pretty rough, I don't just say. And this is the... The photos inside, the photos we've just seen. Yeah, yeah. And these are all your grandfathers through his life or are they all different people? No, they're all the old family. So this is my grandmother since she was 18. Oh, I see. 18 and, and this is their wedding in Berlin. So that was dedicated to pe the people who survived and the people who did not survive. And a lot didn't survive. So where are these balls now? I mean, you have one left, but... I've got one left. I, there was, there were, um, there were, I mean, I had two clients and they bought each two. Um, yeah. Can you move your, your camera has gone down. Just move it a bit because we can't see your face. <laughs> Here we go. So these balls sold. So photos of your family, your roots, your history have sold and have gone to different homes. How do you feel about that? Was that difficult? Uh, was it? Um, it, it well, I think when I was much younger, I, I, I found separating from pieces that I made very difficult. But there was a kind of, um, um, I just letting go, <laughs> a, bit, a bit like letting go of children. It's just like, I've given it my blessing and I, I, I really, I appreciate um, you know, because some of it is, is quite abstract and not all very specific, but it did, you know, the, the one that I had, I had one of uh, Jerusalem and they are quite abstract. So, no, I think, I think it's good. The, it's only, okay. thing, the, the only thing is when you make a set, when you make, couple of pieces which are related to each other. It's quite nice if somebody buys the whole set, but I, I just let go of it now. It's fine. You just let go of it. <laughs> um, so again, then we can see the, uh, the cross here. And then you moved to uh, this project. Yeah. So, um, I mean, using the method, the technique of printing on enamel, is, is enabled me to um, to express my my what I feel and my um, what is you know the world that surrounds us around now. So this this bowl um, is called um, um, sunk trees and it's it's to do with the with the refugees and the boats. So I made a series of of boats. Um, and it's um, it's the only way I can express my my don't know uh, my desperation and and um, I just some way of of actually expressing this idea of what's happened to them, but I do it in a very abstract way. And again, I've um, there are some people who really responded to to this uh, range of work. Um, so when I started making objects, it was all about, I suppose, enhancement and beauty. And now it's more about things I, I can express, um, and care about. So it's more about what's happening today. So this one has the symbolism of the boat. It has the symbolism of the people inside it. What about the fact that um, it has a ridge at the bottom? Is that also related to the shape of a boat? Is it, um, or it just the way that you were visualizing? Um... This is like, like so many things. When you, when you work on, on, on a piece, some wonderful things happen, and I think. It's just, I, I wanted to push the metal. I wanted to, because enamel likes curves and it just, 
to do something different from rather just having a bowl. And it was so tactile. So it's really, it's just holding it in, in, um, in your hand is very, very satisfying because you mm. can put your fingers underneath it. And, um, and the way the image lands on the shape, it's something, you know, it's not just flat. It's right. curved and it's, mm -hmm. it's very tactile. And that is another aspect of my uh, um, thought, thought, I think, yeah. So we discussed that uh, you would do a little demonstration of um, of enameling, and I see that Kathy uh, is is interested in that. I'm sure many other people are. Um, we're going to try to do a little uh, quick demo. <laughs> so you have two types of enamel, don't you? There's cold and there's there's uh, uh, I don't want to say hot enamel. Enamel is cold. It's when you 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 create the do you, do you crush the paste first, the glass first, to create? Enamel, the kind of enamel that I that I use is is vitreous. So my enamel is always fired between seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred degrees. Right. Okay. Silver melts around eight hundred. Gold and copper must fire. Okay. So I work mostly in. Um, so we're going to try to do a little demonstration. Maybe you can tilt your camera so we can see your hands yeah. and um, we can see your desk. Yeah. So, um, I'm just going to... Yeah. So, in some ways, I still work as I did in the 15th century or before. So this is my agate mortar and pestle. And I usually start with a crystal. Right. And I would put some, I'm just going to show you what I do. Can we turn the screen a little bit more to see? Yeah. There we go. That's there. it. Perfect. 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 So this is distilled water. I always use distilled water. And I put a little bit. My students always ask, how can we put this in, the, in a coffee grinding machine? Because it's such hard work. I say no. <laughs> so this already is. Can you see? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's already crushed. Yeah. Yeah. So I will, I will not crush it further because I crush it into a powder. Um. So I'm going to put it in a different. I'm extremely fussy about it all being very, very clean. Um, and there's some processes, you know, you don't have to worry so much about, um, you know, a little bit of dust, but, you know, um, but I'm, I'm... What does dust, dust would create impurities uh, in, the, in the piece once you fire it? This, this is a transparent enamel. I just want to show you. Um, you see this? This is my grandmother's. Right. This is a bit like Fabergé would have done. So you couldn't have a little spot of black on this white. Right. Look all... mm -hmm. I understood. Um, so I'm going to put on my little kiln. So I, I 
I still use um, a gas kiln. It's a bit like cooking. I just like it because it's instant. I mean, uh, I mean, I will have to switch to electric, but. So you crush you crush the enamel to a powder. You add the still water, and then what happens? Right. So I'm gonna. So here I have a piece that's already enameled, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna yeah. I'm, I put a little bit of glue on it. Okay. Yeah. So I have um, a bowl of water. So here it is, my enamel. And there is my clean water. So some people use a quill. But I quite like using a brush. Do you ever use um, a magnifier to do your work? Do you ever no, need to? I do, I do. I mean, what I do is actually, I put a little bit of spit because this is decreases it. So we all do this because this is how we were taught to do it. So I would lay that enamel there. So if I wanted to have them, and you can, you can decide where it goes and how much enamel you're putting. The trick the trick of that enameling is using it in very, very thin layers. So do you have grooves in there now that you are filling oh, with the enamel? No. You're just putting it on top of it? Uh, this one I'm just going to put on top of it. Right. Um, so I'm just giving a little bit of blue. And I'll spread it again a bit. So this is before it's being fired. Right. Now, if I wanted, this is Champlevé, which is the metal is cut out. This is my piece badge. Yeah. Um, and it's beautifully engraved underneath, so I would You feel the you feel the the hole, so to speak, with um, with enamel. Yeah, and you have got to knock it a little bit because it has to go into all the little grooves. Mm -hmm. Right, very delicate. So it is a very different way of working with print. It's a different, you know, there are so many different techniques. So would you fire that um, um, bit by bit or would you fire the piece when all the enamel is everywhere? Do you fire color after color? No, you, you, because it's silver, I have to, I have to lay the whole piece. Right. Because if I will put it in the kiln, this piece is going to oxidize, which means the, co the copper component in the sterling silver will go right to the top. And then the transparent blue will look absolutely awful on the, on the copper oxide. Right. So by laying it all on in one go is crucial. Mm -hmm. So this is where it becomes extremely demanding craft. Because right. if, if, you do, if you do a big piece, you got to cover the first layer. Afterwards, you're safe. 
Right. Um, and this is, and cleaning the silver, of course, with gold, it doesn't matter. You can, you can do a little bit and you can put it in the, in the acid, clean it up and then carry on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with silver is very, very tricky. Right. And co copper is easy. It's easier, but we can thin, thin layers, but the first one is absolutely crucial. Right. So and how long would you, how long would you fire this for? Well, I, I will show you now. I just, you, can you see the small thing? Yeah. yeah, we can. Can you see? Yeah. We had pizza oven. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a chance to do, um, uh, when we went to London, actually Susan was with me, we went to London for London Craft Week and there was a gentleman doing an enameling demonstration in one of the location and he asked who would like to try and I did and it was extraordinarily frustrating because it, it doesn't go where you want it to go and it pools in a place where you don't want it to pool and uh, anyway, so, uh, so how long is this going to cook for? Under a minute. And how do you know when it's ready? Do you is so do you just I, check? I, I'm, I just I just take it out and look, but I can tell. But when I right. do when I do my big pieces, I time it. But also I I I just look in the kiln and see what's happening. So if you have an electric kiln with a timer, you can you know, you can set it up, but you, you know, each firing is different. How much enamel you've done, how warm the kiln is. It's, it's basically just looking what's happening. Right. Experience, knowledge, instinct, it's, and, ch and checking regularly. It's a little bit like cooking. <laughs> so nice. So now it's going to a sugar, a sugar state. So I just wanted to show you, this is, um, this is a transfer. Right. And I'm just going to put it on, on a piece of, on a piece of test that I've got. I just want to show you what I do with the transfers. Okay. So I put it in a little bit of water. Is it plastic? Is it a photo? What is it? It is a photo as part of Jerusalem. Okay. Photographs. Contemporary Jerusalem. Yeah, don't forget the cooking. That's what I do. I put it in the oven, then I walk away and I forget. So these are my two hands that I just got to be careful. So, so that is, that is fused now. Mm -hmm. Can I? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we just need to, to wait until it cools down. Yep. It will cool down. So here I have my my decal, my transfer. It has to separate from from the paper, from the backing. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. It's fine. So it's really set and it's on it, yeah. Yeah, so I would at this point I use um, a stone or a diamond file to grind it because it's standing up a bit and I will refire it. Right. And how many times would you do that? Well, each piece. <laughs> Sometimes I go with my big pieces, I go 10, 12 times back in the kiln. Wow. But 
and, and it takes, you know, it takes two minutes, two and a half minutes in the big pieces. It's, it's extremely demanding craft, this is for sure. Um, and as long as I've done it, um, it's, it's still demanding. <laughs> They're always surprised. Well, maybe you could show us some of your uh, other pieces while the decal is uh, is working, because you have a few pieces there. And um, bring the screen back up, maybe. Because um, we have a little bit of a, of a timing that we have to stick to. Yeah. So maybe we can have a look at your pieces. And if there are any questions, put them in the chat box. I see the question. Yeah, show us your pieces. wondered if I would put the computer just tell me if light wise it's okay can you see yeah it? if you put it yes that's great like that just bring the pieces from the from the bench to the computer and we can see them nicely that's it perfect so these are two cups mm -hmm. are they silver this is silver isn't it can you see they've got a yeah. bump on the side yeah this is this is them and so that this is the talking to each other. <laughs> That's lovely. So Were they made for a specific project or just pieces that no, you made like that? It's to do with leaves again, it's to do with my kind of right. side of work that I'm working with. It's gorgeous. These are two two boxes. So I do want to put them on the table too, so you can see them. Mm -hmm. And the, the lid, yeah. So these oh, are gorgeous. cups and a box. So mm -hmm. people can use them for spice boxes. Um, right. And, and spice box has a very specific uh, uh, meaning in the Jewish tradition, doesn't it? Yes. It's, it's the object that you, um, you know, you mark the end of the Sabbath and you, um, it's wishing you a good luck for the week and, and you have a, usually a spice, um, which is of your choice. So I'll just show you another, another spice box. So at the end of this of the Sabbath, which the end is the Saturday night when the sun goes down, um, there is a special uh, candle that is burnt, and there is a whole ritual. And one of that part of that ritual is to open the spice box and to um, uh, smell the spices again. And 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 the box goes around the members of the family. Uh, so it's a very strong um, uh, symbolism to that. Yeah. So this is this is nice. This is again olive tree in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It's got cloves in there, so it's absolutely wonderful smell. Right, and it's enameled inside too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you make the box itself, or do you just do the enameling? No, I do. I do the no. Here's a, my colleague does it. Yeah. So they're, they're quite heavy these. Mm hmm. Beautiful. So they, they also so these these actually screw, and they've got a little bit of a gold foil in the bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are my series of boxes. Um, and do you still have some of your uh, boat shape or or a leaf shape the the oval vessels? Mm 
That's right. So these are, again, it's so important how they're held in their hand. Um, mm -hmm. So this is them. Felt trees, I call it, because there was a tree in the garden which we had to cut down because it grew under this house. Um, it was a Canadian maple. Um, and so I took, this is the photograph I took of its leaves. And this is, you know, it's, it's about, gorgeous. It is about trees cutting and cut down. Um, and everything that I associate with, you know, it's going to be with mm -hmm. people, you know, when you cut their roots. And this one was made after I visited the American, African American Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, and there was this amazing um, record of, of the, the boat um, in the 18th century and in what terrible condition they lived in. Um, so this is my, my, my response also to the tragedy of the boat mm -hmm. It was inspired Fantastic. By, by the slave boat. Right. So I, I, really, I, I really enjoyed doing that. And then um, this is an older... This is an older piece and it's called the split tree and it's a tray and in here you can see this is the walls of Jerusalem. All right. So it goes all the way to the side and it's got it's also split here and it's also it's split tree in Jerusalem, so it's, it, it is symbolic, just reflecting what about it's, mm. what's going on there. Fantastic. Um, Tamar, we're going to have to, um, uh, if you want to sit and we can see you before we end, <laughs> we're going to have to, uh, to move on, I'm afraid. Um, but it was really fantastic. I wonder if there are any um, uh, last uh, questions for Tamar. I think that all your work we can see on your website, which I have shared with everybody. Um, and obviously we'll come and, and see you when we are in uh, when we are in Cambridge <laughs> and you are going to do um, Goldsmith Fair in September. I, I am hoping I'll be able to uh, go there and at least, you know, share the work digitally, if not uh, in person for those who can uh, travel with us or with me. But um, even if I can't go there, I know that um, there will be a, a program uh, through partnership too, so um, we'll we'll be sure to uh, to reconnect with you uh, then. Um, I think I can't see any uh, any questions, but thank you so very much. Um, it was really so enjoyable and and so wonderful. Your story is uh, is fabulous. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Here we go. All right. Uh, okay, ladies, um, it was a little longer than I had anticipated. <laughs> I apologize for that. Tamar was not in a chatty mood today. <laughs> Last week we couldn't stop her talking, and and today she just wouldn't. Um, lots of, lots of symbolism in there, and I wish she had shared more about her story, and but she just uh, she just wouldn't go there. I don't know why, and. Um, because there were multiple peoples on the screen, maybe one on one, she is more intimate. So that's true. It's, it's her work possible. Is, it's exquisite. Her silver work, I love that. It. It's oh. exquisite. She's very yeah. intense. Uh, uh -huh. And and more, I love the trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised yeah. by how contemporary some of the pieces were, like the silver cup with the blue, <clears throat> the cobalt. Oh, I love that. And that yeah. was gorgeous. I wouldn't look at that piece and look at her and her story. Yeah, and, good and point. Yes. Yeah. That was amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, those uh, candlesticks. Yes. Love those candlesticks and uh, the usable and just gorgeous. Yeah. I found the translation between a multitude of layers of memory 
translated into a single delicate piece that's so delicate, not fragile, but but delicate, and you could hold in the palm of your hand. The 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 just the the journey from all that memory, all the that, that's loaded with so much of a story of history, um, and then translated into something so beautiful and delicate. Mm -hmm that has the story, you have to not to know the story. To me, that's 10 times more powerful than the 10 boxes of books and documents. And you know, yeah. like the, the, if you want to know the story, do you know what I mean? It's like taking that and synthesizing it and giving it to us in a new restored way. I found that very powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was surprised that um, she was okay give, i mean selling it because it's a family history and i that to me mm -hmm. was a little surprising um and, i said and, she had doubts about that afterwards <laughs> she had said again i said she had second thoughts about that that they were maybe. separated the collection was separated and you know yeah yeah maybe oh. but um I anyway very um well, so that's uh, that's the end of our program uh, today. We we had a little bit of um, uh, hiccup, and I, I apologize for that. But it wasn't too too bad. I was a little worried about uh, about Italy. I was wrong. Um, tomorrow we start again. <laughs> Irene is laughing. Um, tomorrow we start again at uh, nine o'clock, and we should you should all have the um, uh, the program. Uh, we're going to, uh, well, we start with Irene. Uh, we always start with Irene. We're going to talk uh, mosaics tomorrow. Then we're going to go to um, Andrea Salvatori. So that is going to be yep. um, out of this world. And mm. there's going to be no issue with talking there. I can promise you that. Um, he is a um, um, ceramic artist who mixes pieces that he finds, you know, in places wherever he goes. And you're going to see his warehouse has tens of thousands of objects in it. It is mind blowing. It's um, and he lives in there. You're going to see his bed is in the middle of the warehouse. Oh. It is the most extraordinary thing. Um, I'm going to share with you today. I'll send you links um Marco Venturi whom we met last week he is the owner of Made in Brutally not last week two weeks ago on our last trip he was part of the uh, Crafting a Difference collective and uh, we talk with him and with Rosanne Guyen do you remember those who were with me the artist who was going into her garden and was using plants and uh, creating almost uh, coral-like uh, pieces. So uh, same gallerist, and, uh, but this time going to Italy, there's going to be uh, with us because um, Andrea Salvatori speaks very little English. So there's another lady who's going to be there who's also an artist and who's going to give us um, the translation but also add elements to it. But um, Marco sent me some references of books to Dadaism, uh, which is very important in the work of Andrea Salvatore. So I'm going to share that with you. Um, so if you have time to do a little of prep before tomorrow, if you're interested in. Otherwise, you have the references that we have in the, um, in the brochure that you received. Um, and then we go from there to uh, Dianora. Um, who's going to share her story with us and show us her scars. I just want to emphasize that there is no expectation that you're going to purchase anything, um, but her story is interesting and, uh, and um, uh, her family is related to the Medici's on the banker's side. So uh, if we can get that story out of her, it's going to be interesting. Again, Italy and different parts is in is in strict lockdown, and I know that she is. Uh, she's mentioned it to me two, three times. She will be wearing her mask because she's in her um, studio, and there's going to be someone with her. But we should be able to um, uh, to hear. I had no difficulty hearing and understanding her when I spoke to her a couple of days ago. So, uh, so that's the scoop. Um, a little bit less rock and roll than it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's uh, the pace is going to pick up tomorrow, and uh, I think you're going to be quite entertained tomorrow. <laughs> so. 
I, I was quite entertained today. That's so yeah. good, yeah. good. But it felt last last time we had personalities that were uh, huge personalities with the artists and the galleries. So um, this felt a little a little quiet today. I don't know why. <laughs> mm, it's lovely. Oh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. You're very welcome. Great. I'll Fantastic. see you all tomorrow. Thank yes. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye, -bye. You. bye, -bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. À bientôt. Where's my Zoom? Oh. Irene, do you want to stay on and we can just prep for tomorrow a little bit? Arrivederci, Irene. Grazie mille. Ci vediamo Ciao. Domani. Ciao. Ciao. A se domani. Ciao. <laughs> I don't know how to get out now. Is that? <laughs> well. There we go. Okay. Love her. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, it was good.